But enough talking. Here we are, all of us, here to put an end to this. We arrive at last at the final mainline chapter of the Higurashi story. Who knows where this is going to take us? Well, only Polly knows. But the rest of you, I think you're in for a fun little ride. So let's not waste any time dawdling and just get started, shall we? Shall we? So this is Matsuri Bayashi. At least let it end with a blissful dream. A festi the festival accompanying chapter. The riddle you have been entrusted with solving now finally becomes unraveled. What must be done to stop the chain? And what will happen in the ultimate end? It's a showdown between it's a showdown between the conclusion you reached and the one I reached. There is no difficulty. You should understand that now. And away we go. <laughs> Everyone is entitled to happiness. The difficult part is accepting that. Everyone is entitled to happiness. The difficult part is fulfilling that. I too am entitled to happiness. The difficult part is working out a compromise. That sounds familiar. The study was filled with piles of books and papers. In that study, there, were, there, was a full there was a full figured old man writing something at his desk in utmost concentration. There was also a little girl sorting out papers on the carpet. She almost looked as though she was playing with them, but the serious expression she was wearing made it clear she wasn't. さて、全頭葉に Y'all enjoying this uh, science lesson out there? Y'all know that emotions are just side effects from secre secretions of chemicals in an organ known as the brain. So are parasites the cause of the spread of ideology? When ideologies clash, is it because different parasites are competing to expand their habitat? おじいちゃんと we're finally meeting Grandpa. Nimo Kakawarazu, Jintai ni Sempukushi, Sono Yadonushi or Shihai Sulu, Seme Tai no Sonzai ni Tsuitua, Katakuna ni Hite Stekita. Gone, John, hope you're doing well. Kate Sulamo Kumetena. Toste Darone Ningen Naketokubetsna Sonzai no Wakewa Nainoni. 
それを仮定することはすなわち意思に基づいた言動や信念を疫学的原因から派生したものと置き換えられて対処策もそれと同様とみなされる危険があるからだ。Oh, dang, yeah, you're getting ready. You like, you've just blazed through this, huh? If conflicts, if conflicts and ideology can be resolved through debate, then, they can be, then they're peaceful. But if those conflicts occur epidemically, they become frightening. And if one were to treat bad thoughts or the spread of culture as an epidemic, 中世の歴史に登場するペストなどを想像しなさい。What do you think of the interesting way that,、uh, the, the interesting gimmick this chapter has, by the way, without spilling it? I think this chapter has an interesting way of kind of advancing the plot and kind of giving you the information you need. 悪い伝染病が大流行する。その患者を強制的に入院させ、感知するまで退院させない。感知できずそのまま病院で死んでしまうこともあるするとその死体は焦燥となるさらに患者が触れたものまで衛生のため全て没収して焼き捨てる身近の家族にも感染の疑いがあるから強制的に入院させねばならん So they'd hospitalize healthy people over individual ideas. The rest is the same. ベストとは違う If an idea was created by parasites, it would be exactly the same as a plague. So you mean anyone with a different idea is treated like they have a disease? So you mean anyone with a different idea is treated like t h そうすると人類は大規模な粛清を肯定してしまう論調になりかねだから脳内で宿主を支配する生命体を語ることは今の時代ではタブーになっているのだ<笑> Again, it's something that just like it's startling how、uh, relevant so much of what this game's doing is ふれてはならない考えてもならないということだなだから誰も研究せいやそれどころか脳内に侵入し影響を及ぼす存在がいると考えることすら忘れられている万物の超たる霊長類を支配する未知の生命体などいるはずがないと頭から決めつけている <笑>いないことの証明なんて悪魔の証明絶対に不可能なのにその通り悪魔がいることを証明することは絶やすい悪魔を連れてくればいいのだからなだがいないことを証明することはできニーパーフォーグランパー <笑> I think we can I think we can manage that. There you go, sir. Inai o tsrete kurkoto na do dekin no da kara na. Nanda ka no o shihai suru seimei tai ga jibun tachi no sonzai o himits ni suru tame ni sono yado nushi no ningen tachi o ayatsutte iru mi tai. Sometimes you gotta have them crops refreshed. Me and my grandfather shared a happy laugh together. Oh no! 
Sayara, don't go hate little girls. That's wrong. Come on. <laughs> oh, Sayara's just already done. <laughs> あらゆる微生物やウイルスに支配されうるのだ。その それらの過程をした科学者が全て生きているうちに評価を受けられたわけではない。よまいごとだと呆れられ、その正しさを証明できなかった科学者も大勢いたのだ。でも、おじいちゃんは生きているうちに証明されるといいね。じゃなかったら
自分が生きているうちに評価されることに焦る必要はないのだその時が訪れるのが私が生きているうちなのかそうそれは神様にもわからないだがその日は必ず訪れるだからその日の訪れを疑うことなくひたすらに努力を続けなくてはならないのだよ See, like, I had gathered that, like, when we were doing the original localization、um, stuff, especially in the answer arcs.、Um, I noticed that there was a real heavy emphasis on this stuff,、uh, especially, like, and it felt like the, their original scripts really kind of wanted to excise a lot of it, or they didn't word it、um, in ways that, like, made it as blatant as it is. Um, in the original text, so I kind of like might have pushed a little bit for that to, to, to be like, look, like it's it's very like this is very on the nose. How, like, w- whether they're actually Christians or not, the, 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 Christian, the Christian ideologies that are being put forth by these characters are very clearly important to them, and I think like changing that and removing it. Is, 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 or, or, or making, or, or, or not translating it well enough、uh, so that that comes through kind of short changes what it very clearly symbolically means to these characters, right? Like, I think that's kind of where I'm coming from at it. It was very sad to hear my grandfather say that his life would end one day. He wasn't ill, and he didn't only have a few years left to live, but. Set next to the average lifespan, his remaining years didn't look like much. The only person left in my life was my grandfather, so I didn't even want to consider what would it be, what would it be like with him gone. Grandfather must have remembered that I didn't like to talk about that subject. With a tender smile, he gently patted my head. I purposely didn't mention the before you die part. I caught myself before I said it. Grandfather smiled in satisfaction. His research wasn't exactly outrageous. He wasn't trying to uncover the mysteries of the universe. He was only searching for the possibility that parasites could be responsible for human behavior. Nothing more than that. Nothing outrageous. It really wasn't a, va- it really wasn't a wild idea. We even, had, we even had some leads. Hinamazawa Village, Shishibone City, it's in the Gifu Prefecture, I believe. The villagers are possessed by a powerful homesickness. When they are unable to return, they allegedly behave abnormally, as if they are cursed. There are also some bizarre rules in place in the village based on their belief system. When he was working with the military during the war, my grandfather noticed similarities between the people in Hinamazawa and assumed that some kind of existence was responsible for their odd behavior. He'd been researching it ever since then. In the middle of the 20th century, numerous strange diseases were discovered all over Japan. Most of them were caused by infectious parasites, and people started to pay attention to this forgotten field of study. Grandfather's research was simply one of those investigations into such diseases. Therefore, he believed it would be published amongst other research and attain, and, and attain recognition soon. But if, if his research didn't bear fruit before his death, I wanted to continue it. I wanted to continue his research. Grandfather taught me resurrection isn't something that happens physically. It's when your life's work is appreciated. That's what he meant by resurrection. That's when he'll become a god. That's when my, that's, that's, so when my grandfather dies, he'll still be with me forever. I wouldn't have to be alone ever again. I will always be with my grandpa. Our works gain recognition, and we will both become gods, gaining eternal peace. I will make my grandfather into a god. I will become a god. Therefore, we will be granted eternity. We'll be together forever and ever. I was looking at the key on a keychain. 
the key was labeled Hen House. But the lock Erica was trying, was trying to open didn't belong to that door. It should have opened effortlessly. At least that's what was supposed to happen, but it didn't open. I noticed beads of sweat forming on Erica's forehead. She was the one who came up with this idea. Erica was starting to panic. The rest of us started to panic too. This only opens the hen house. Let's stop. Let's go back. Shush. We were supposed to be cleaning out the hen house, but if they found us back here, if they found out that we were here and why we were trying to open the lock to this back door, then all four of us were going to be sentenced to splayed piggy. You don't, you don't ever want to be sentenced to splayed piggy. Don't panic, Erico. The key opens this lock, right? You already tried it, right? Will you shut up for a minute? <laughs> this is the right key. It's just hard to open, that's all. She, she was almost shrieking. Our hearts were pounding loudly. It was as though the sound of our heartbeats was echoing throughout the hallway. And at that point, we heard footsteps that didn't belong to a child. Shush! Somebody's coming! The three of us held our breath, but Erico didn't hear it. She kept fussing with the lock and the key, as if everything would be okay if she could just open the lock. Erico, somebody's coming. Be quiet. I know this is the right key. I'm not dreaming. I already tried it and it opened. Come on, why isn't this working? When this lock was when this lock is open, we can be happy. We can say goodbye to this hell. Ergo, someone's coming. Uh-oh. That's probably not good. My father and mother died. I don't know exactly how old they were. I was too young to remember. They went shopping without me, and that must be why they were punished. It was a train accident. What a terrible disaster. A lot of people died in that incident. But maybe my father was one of the lucky ones. He was still alive when he arrived at the hospital, so he was able to share his final words with me. My mother died instantly. I didn't want to admit that this person I could hardly recognize was my father. As I called out to him, I hoped that it was someone else instead. But unfortunately, it was my father. Maybe I shouldn't have woken him. Because when I woke him up, he was reminded of the miserable agony that he had forgotten. <laughs> he tried to move his right arm so he could pat my head but his arm was wrapped in bandages and his hand was no longer there. I couldn't find his hand anywhere in the bed. I only had scary memories of his right hand. Its main job was to slap me when I did something bad, but I never wished it to be gone. Besides, that hand also patted my head, even though I, it only happened a few times. It was a big, warm hand and it stroked my head very gently, but no matter what good deeds I did, he could no longer rub my head. No. His hand was the least of his worries. He had to go into emergency surgery. The doctors already warned me that the chance of him surviving was very low. That was why I was allowed to see him, regardless of his condition. Not only could he no longer rub my head, he might be gone forever. よく聞きなさい。お父さん。ダメかもしれない。もしもお父さんが死んだら、お前はしっかり生きるんだよ。嫌だ嫌だ。お父さんは元気になるよ。お医者様がちゃんと手術してくれるもん。He was a stubborn and old-fashioned father. He believed endurance was a virtue, and he never complained about anything. That was why I couldn't believe he actually said he might not make it. I tried desperately to deny his words, but even that wish wouldn't prolong his life. My father, knowing that his time was limited, tried to tell me some important things, but I interrupted his efforts by crying like a baby. I just wanted him to slap me, just like he used to do every time I cried like a baby. But he would never slap me again. <laughs> よく聞きなさい。お父さんも、お母さんも、
親類というものがいないだからお父さんが死んだらお前の世話をしてくれる人は誰もいない Oh that sucks He didn't need to tell me that My parents used to tell me all the time so I was aware of that fact In other words my father was the only relative I had left in this entire world もしもなお父さんが死んだら高野先生を頼りなさい高野ひふみ先生だよ行ってみなさい高野ひふみそうだ高野ひふみ先生だよ高野先生はお父さんの恩師なんだきっとお前を助け All right, John, you have yourself a nice rest of your evening. I hope the rest of the game treats you well. I'll probably see you yelling about it on Twitter, I imagine. <laughs> Many doctors came into the room in a hurry. He wanted to tell me something else, but the doctors stopped him from talking, so I wasn't able to hear him. I was kicked out of the room. I didn't know what to do. Nobody told me how my father was doing or when the surgery was going to start. And nobody told me that was going to be the last conversation I ever had with my father. I think I asked people at the government office about Dr. Takano. They'd asked me if I knew his phone number. I said I didn't. They didn't ask me anything further. Sometimes they told me they'd look into it, but nothing led to anything. They couldn't find me a guardian, so I ended up going to an orphanage. At the time, there were plenty of orphans from the war, so although there were many orphanages around, they were all full. There were also some orphanages run by civilians. I was sent to one of those civilian orphanages. There was no profit to be had in taking in an orphan in the first place, so I thought these civilians who were running orphanages must, be, must have been very good people. I was sure they hoped that the children would grow in this loving environment and enter into society with a sense of gratitude, but reality isn't so kind. How many children in this world can actually express their gratitude towards their parents in the first place? Children are supposed to be nurtured by their parents' love. Therefore, when that environment is destroyed, their hearts are wounded. Every child, <clears throat> every child has his or her own personality. Receiving affection doesn't guarantee that a child will become someone angelic. Not everyone's heart can be healed. That was why there were some problem kids at the orphanage. Maybe I shouldn't call them problem kids, though. The sadness and despair of losing their parents. Hey, Taylor, how's it going? We are having real good times, Nert. Very good times. Perfect time to have ourselves a good fart, get ourselves laugh, get to feeling better again. It'll help. I hope uh, Taylor and Nert are both doing well this evening. The sadness and despair of losing their parents and the anger at having to hide such feelings filled those, filled those kids' hearts. Spending time individually with the children could have solved their problems, but at the orphanage where I was, none of the staff members even tried to spend time with them or put in, any, and put in an effort to understand them. Yet cleaning the oven? Yeah. Yeah. I've been there. I know what that's like. I had an oven fire last summer. So I was like, good, good. That was a fun, that was a fun evening and a half of cleaning out and airing out the place. Let me tell you. All they could do was make sure that the kids followed the rules. Therefore, they could only see the children's emotional pleas for help as problems. In this world, nobody expresses love without expecting something in return. The person who founded the orphanage was expecting something in return as well. He wanted the children to appreciate him. That was such a faint that that was why such a faint dream was destroyed by cruel reality. The children called the orphanage a prison and nobody appreciated the staff at all. In fact, all they did was complain. That made the staff slowly realize that love alone couldn't run a facility like that. Just like how the children called it a prison, the staff started to recognize the facility as a prison too. 
It was a chain reaction resulting from, the mis mis from mistrust on both sides. The staff bound the children with rules so that they could suppress problem behavior. There was a framed picture of the founder of the orphanage, but I never seen him in person. Was he satisfied with the fact that he put his own money into, a so into this social service? Or maybe he finally realized his dream of being surrounded by angelic children and being celebrated for what he did was simply that, a dream. I don't know. But there's one thing I am, I'm certain of. Such a dream didn't exist at the orphanage. There were so many rules and several, pl and several plausible standards outlined for us, but the most valued one was silence. Children's chatter tends to increase each other's volumes, just like mics drawing closer. And sometimes this leads to fights and disturbance of order. So children were forbidden from speaking to e children were forbidden from speaking with e with each other. With these, with that disallowed, they must have thought that things would go smoothly. However, I think I always heard people's voices at the orphanage. There were two kinds of voices. One was the staff yelling, and the other was the children crying. We were not allowed to walk around out inside the orphanage freely, so we never knew who 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 it was that was crying. One time, along with the crying and yelling, we heard the noise of metallic things being smashed against each other. We knew it was some kind of punishment, but there was no way for us to even imagine what it was. We trembled, pretended we didn't hear anything, and kept working on our assignments. One of my roommates told me it was the casket punishment, but she didn't tell me any further, and I didn't want to know either. Even if we behaved exactly the same way as yesterday, the staff were in a bad if the staff were in a bad mood, they might pick on us. So, even if I didn't want to know, I might suddenly find out what the casket punishment is one day. The footsteps of a staff member were getting closer. We noticed them, so we straightened our backs, pretended we were studying hard. It was more important that the staff saw us doing, doing so rather than actually getting any work done. I noticed the girl next to me was falling asleep, so I poked her with my elbow. She noticed my signal and straightened her back like the other children. It was almost evening. This was the hardest time for us to keep ourselves awake and the most dangerous time. The door to our room opened and a mean-looking man showed up. Then he looked around to make sure none of us were falling asleep. Even if we were actually studying hard, he thought we were asleep. Uh, we were out. That was why we had to make sure we appeared to be studying very hard. The man walked around our desks. I hoped he would just walk by me, but that, that was what we all prayed as we kept working on our homework. The more we pretended to study hard, the more we could hear the sound of metal objects. The sound of metal objects crashing into each other, along with screams. We couldn't even imagine what the poor subject of that punishment was going through. Maybe there was something even worse than the casket punishment. To erase such fears, we tried to concentrate even harder on our work. We kept working. As the metal sounds of the screams went, went on forever, The only time we were allowed to exchange words was with our roommates was right after turning the lights off to go to bed. Being located in the middle of the mountains, the orphanage was very quiet at night. After making sure the staff members were far enough from our room, we enjoyed talking amongst ourselves. That was the only leisure time allowed to us, though it wasn't anything nice like enjoying pleasant conversation. Why? Because we mostly talked about others behind their backs. We spoke of things like that member of the staff is, is only strict and unfair or malicious towards that person and so on. We just repeated those topics forever until someone couldn't keep themselves awake anymore. We even discussed how we could get back at the staff and we took revenge on all of, all of them in our imagination. Some kids even started to cry when talking about it, difficult as it was for us. Although the subjects we spoke of were negative, talking about them was the only way to vent our frustration, and even though we felt despair about tomorrow, we were able to fall asleep. But sometimes, a different subject popped up. It was about the Yorigauka House of Love and Mercy on the other side of the river. Yeah, over there, I hear they got not only nap time, but snack time too. Plus, their president is a very nice person. The House of Love and Mercy was a privately run orphanage. It was, it was just like the one I was at, but it was a very kind facility unlike ours. It seemed like a fantasy land compared to our current environment. A few years before, when this place was a lot worse, a few children tried to escape. It was hard to believe there was a time when this orphanage was even worse to live at. Supposedly three or four people tried to escape. I don't know the exact number though. 
They headed to the house of love and mercy. Their escape was a success, except for one lucky child. They were able to get to the property of the house of love and mercy. I guess the staff couldn't follow them into the other orphanage's property. In other words, the other facility's property had to, had to be out of their jurisdiction. The staff were frustrated that kids got away from them, and they dragged the one caught back here. I'm sure they wanted to bring back the others who got away from them too. I'm certain the staff were determined not to let a single one escape. It was easy to see the determination in the obstinate way. They locked the place up after the event. But they were never able to bring back the ones that got away. No matter how much the staff were mortified, they couldn't reclaim the children and punish them. In other words, if you could make it to the house of love and mercy, then you could escape the evil clutches of this hell. On the other hand, the one they caught went through such misery afterwards, yet the exact details of how he was punished were never passed down. All that remained was an ominous phrases left by those who knew him at the time. The drowned ducky, the mashed caterpillar, the splayed piggy. I can't even imagine what kind of punishments they were. The only thing I can say is that those punishments were supposed to be far more harsh than the casket punishment, which was the most cruel punishment I knew at the time. I can only imagine how horrible those punishments were from the ominous names. After that, the captured kid's wish came true, and I skipped a text box. <laughs> After that, the captured kid's wish came true, and, were, and they were able to, and they were, and he was able to leave the orphanage. Was he able to leave the orphanage safely and enjoy his freedom while breathing in fresh air from under the blue sky? Well, according to the rumors, that wasn't what happened at all. While he was playing in the boiler room, he slipped and fell, injured his brain, and died. The children were instructed not to go into the boiler room after that incident. Everyone knew the boiler room was always locked. So everyone knew he was killed. And not just that, he was killed after being tortured. He was killed to teach the other children that they would face hell on earth if they tried to escape. Yet those who faced that risk and made it out obtained ordinary average lives full of love, <clears throat> full of love and mercy's namesake, which were far better conditions than we lived in here. Maybe the house of love and mercy was really heaven. Maybe all the orphanages are pretty much the same, but compared to my orphanage, I bet anything else would have been better. Even if someone escaped successfully, the police would catch him. Then he'd be sent back to the orphanage, which would, pretty, which would be pretty much the same as being killed. However, if he could reach the house of love and mercy, they'd take him in. That would, they wouldn't send him back. But talking about escaping to the House of Love and Mercy, we were trying to forget how cruel reality was to us. Then one day, the leader of our group, Eriko, said to us quietly, Would you try to escape if you had a chance to? Who wouldn't want to escape from here? It was a rather foolish question, but that wasn't what she meant. If there was a chance to escape, would you take that chance knowing what you had to go through if you got caught? That was what she meant. Not one of us could answer immediately. If the previous escape incident was a total success, then we might have thought differently. But after that, the orphanage had tightened up security to prevent runaways. All the doors and windows were locked heavily, and it wouldn't be all that easy to get out. Even if another group escape was planned, the success rate would be very low. Three escaped and one was caught before. Maybe two would be caught next time. No, maybe... No, maybe everyone would be. Even if I could, I'd want to escape. But the House of Love and Mercy is so far away. The bridge is long, too. We'll all be caught before we get there. Besides, we can't even go outside. Everything is locked up. There were locks all over the orphanage. To escape, they'd have a key for both the inside and the outside. And after lights were turned off, each, even each section of the hallway was individually locked. Make no mistake, this was a prison. According to the rumors, orphanages receive government funding depending on the number of children they house. So, if anyone escapes, they lose money. Also, if they were to expose the conditions of the orphanage, that would end up being inspected and things would get complicated for them. That was why they were so intent on keeping us locked up. Sure, if there was a chance, I would want to escape. But realistically, there's no way we could. Every door is locked. Well... Did you know the hen house in the courtyard uses the same key as the door of the back stairs? Eh? Really? Shh. Erica shushed us. <laughs> Sometimes mass-produced locks take the same key. 
Of course, most places use different types of locks so that this won't happen, but the staff at the orphanage must have overlooked it. So there were two locks that were used that used the same key at the orphanage. However, most of us had never had a chance to even touch the keys, but there were a few exceptions. One of those was the hen house. Each room, each room group took turns taking care of different chores. If your group was assigned to clean the hen house, you'd have to go you'd have to get the key to it from the teacher's office. You were supposed to return the key immediately after you were done, but while taking care of the hen house, the key was in the children's hands. While the staff would occasionally come around to check, they couldn't keep an eye on us forever. Eriko-chan, you aren't thinking about using the key, are you? Let's not. It's too dangerous. Of course it's dangerous if there's only one of us, but it's different if we're in a group. Wait, why? Do you know why only one kid was caught the last time they tried to escape? They were desperate. And so, to escape, as a group, they did something to increase the chances of success. That was why only one of them was caught. What did they do? They scattered as they ran. They dashed into different directions. They waited until the day when there were only a few people working at the orphanage and ran this way and that. And so, although it all depended on luck, it would increase the chance of success for sure. On your own, you'd probably have no hope, but if the staff were to chase after other children, then your own chance of escaping successfully would increase. In other words, Eriko was inviting us to escape with her. The more children joined, the more, the more, each, of us, the more each of our chances would increase. But among us, there were children who but among us, there were children who tattled the staff for their own benefit, so she had to be very careful about who she talked to. Eriko must have trusted us a lot. Eriko, me, Tomomi, and Kikuo. Four children. Do any of you want to stay here a day longer? The three of us shook our heads, but at, that same but at the same time, we couldn't agree to escape with her either. Of course we don't want to stay a day longer, or even an hour longer. Even if we did exactly the same thing as we did yesterday, we might get yelled at tomorrow. I can't stand this anymore. <laughs> they stood on each other's shoulder in a trench coat and pretended to be an adult! I mean, I don't see why not. I think that would work. It sounds like a reasonable method of escape to me. I can't stand this anymore. I can't stand living in fear of what to do and what not to do so I won't be yelled at. We all feel the same way. We could ensure... We we could endure strict rules, but it was almost impossible to endure vague ones. It wasn't too much of a stretch to say that the rules depended on the mood of the staff. This is okay. That isn't okay. Such borderline rules change daily. And if we were to say anything about that, we would be treated horribly for it. I will escape, even if I have to do it alone. Like I said, the more people that join, the better our chance. Think about it. If they find out about this hen house key trick, I'm sure that they'll change the lock on the back door. In other words, we only have one chance, so even if you regret not joining in later, it'll be too late. But, oh, I'm scared. I'm scared too. <laughs> Thank you for the resub, Raven. Much appreciated. Do we have a trick and people to help us? Well, we've got a hen house and a key that works on two places at the orphanage. Also, Takano is an orphan. That's where we're at right about now. <laughs> Hope you're doing well this evening. I'm scared too. If we get caught, we'll be killed. Tomobi and Ki Tomobi and Ku <laughs> <laughs> Words! Tomobi and Kikuo weren't the only ones who felt afraid. The fear was perfectly understandable, because all of a sudden the fear of the punishment that would follow had become very realistic. I'm sure Eriko felt the same way too. But her courage was, suppo was, was suppressing her fear. And because of that, she shared her idea with us. So, do you plan to stay here forever? No, 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 no way. Well, that's, that's what we're finding out. Uh, we're finding out that uh, her parents died in a train accident. Um, her dad knew of a person to kind of help her out, who's named uh, Hifumi Takano. He is a researcher of brain diseases and parasites. Um, and we, she tried to relay that information to the government, uh, but they couldn't find him. So she got kind of stuck in a citizen-run uh, orphanage that's kind of a hellhole. 
And that has probably done a murder or two on children. So, that's kind of where we're at right now. I know you're scared, but this is the only chance we have. You have to be brave just this once. What about you, Miyoko? Also, Takano's name is Miyoko. Don't you want to go with me? Unlike Tomomi and Kukuo, I wasn't trembling that much. Of course, I was scared in my own way, but compared to the other two, I must have appeared rather calm. Can we really escape? Of course, Eriko couldn't guarantee our success, but I had to ask her anyway. There's no guarantee, but if you join me, it'll be better. You'll have, it'll, I'll have a better, I'll have a better chance of escaping than trying to run on my own. Of course, the same goes for you, too. Eriko gave a calculated reason, but I'm sure she just wanted a friend to agree with her. That was probably more important to her than increasing her chances to escape. Tomomi, Kikuo, if you're too scared, then I won't force you. Miyoko and I will escape ourselves. Two is enough. Uh, well... Eriko rushed the two to make up their minds. It almost looked cold, but it was her way of mustering their courage. Because it was a very po- it was a because it was very possible that, regardless of the outcome of our escape attempt, as our roommates, those two would be held responsible. It's not like we'll do it tomorrow. Our turn to, our turn to take care of the hen house is in a week. We'll wait for the perfect time to do it. If we don't feel that it's safe, then we'll wait until it's our ne to wait until our next turn. We'll be very careful. The rotation of the staff and the timing were important, but we also each had to know the way to the. To, we each had to know the way to the house of love and mercy. We were planning to split up so we would know so we had to know the area. I made up my mind. Okay. I'm coming with you. But let's time our escape very carefully, okay? Of course. We'll be killed if we get caught. I don't want to die. I'll come too. Me too, me too. Tomomi and Kikuo agreed, so we all decided to escape as a group. We waited for the perfect opportunity. We waited for the day where only a few staff members were at the orphanage. And we decided to let God take care of the rest. Give me just one second, people. I'll be right back. Having to read a bit extra than we used, you know, the, having to read a little more than we used, we, we're used to having to read, uh, and having allergies on top of that is literally killing my throat. <laughs> it's not fun times tonight, so we're probably only doing one chapter. I'm sorry about that, but oh lord, I didn't know that so much of this uh, chapter was not voiced. <laughs> ah, it's open. Maybe it was the way I did it. Erica, Erica tried to open the lock several times without success, but I got it to open on the first attempt. The back door opened slowly, and we felt a cold breeze. This wasn't the world of freedom just yet. In fact, it was the exact opposite. If the staff were to find us out, if the, if the staff were to find out we were here, we would be in big trouble. It was a world of danger. But unless we went through the dangerous world, we weren't able to go any further. Yes. Okay. Let's go. Oh, okay, now you can talk. Thank you, Eriko. I appreciate you. I appreciate you having the goal to speak now. That does me some good. Thanks for the help. I think Eriko wanted to say that. We were planning to leave as, that was that, with that as our cue. But what we heard instead wasn't Eriko's voice. Oh, this is probably bad. We started the run. It was raining. We all got soaked immediately and our clothes stuck to our skin. While that would normally be very uncomfortable, we couldn't even stop to think about that. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> you think so? <laughs> we could only keep running in the rain. We were dashing on gravel, but it was more like trudging through muddy through a muddy rice field. My, my feet kept sinking and I couldn't pull them up. 
I was frustrated because no matter how fast I tried to run, I wasn't gaining any speed. I felt a sense of urgency. I heard someone yelling escape behind me and all I could do was run like crazy. Okay, yeah, Erico doesn't... Do you want to... You... Erico, do you want to speak? No? You don't? Okay. Okay, everyone, go in different directions. Okay. Is there just something wrong here, or is this not voiced? <laughs> like, it sounds like there's a, a, an error or something going on. <laughs> With Ergo's Q, we all went we all went different ways, hoping that we would, hoping that they wouldn't be coming after us. Would we be able to reunite safely at the House of Love and Mercy? All four all four of us there together, or maybe someone was would be missing. No, maybe everyone else would make it, and I'd be the one who gets caught. My thoughts were interrupted by the voice of a staff member coming from behind me. The staff members should have numbered fewer than us, so if I was lucky, they wouldn't be coming after me. Praying that the staff voices I heard in the distance weren't after me, I looked back for a moment. If I had time to turn around, why didn't I take another step forward? Why didn't I try to escape further? Oh no. As I turned around, I felt a huge hand cover my face! No! Its pinky finger slipped into my open mouth. The hand grabbing my face shoved me to the muddy gravel. Of course, I couldn't. St I didn't stay quiet. I fought back, and then I saw his face. It was the scariest face I'd ever seen. I realized it immediately. He only wanted to capture me alive to use me as an example. And considering what would happen to me afterwards, killing me here on the spot wouldn't pose any problem, would it? Yes, he looked at me with unworldly hate, ready to end my life here and now. His pinky finger ended up touching my tongue. The indescribably nasty taste sent an icky feeling through my whole body. Ah, this is it. This is, my, this is what my murder tastes like. He was going to shove that finger down my windpipe and suffocate me. And so, in order to live, I fought back the only way I could. Something warm filled my mouth. I felt like swallowing, I felt like swallowing blood after a nosebleed. I spit it from my mouth and ran without turning around, leaving behind the staff member clutching his pinky finger. Oh my god, did, did she just bite his fucking finger off? Holy shit! I heard his roars echoing behind me. It wasn't a man that was after me. It was a beast. He had no interest in capturing me. His only goal was to see me dead. My shoes had slipped off. They weren't sneakers, so they came off easily while I was running like mad. My bare feet struck the gravel over and over. It was painful, but I didn't care, because if I stopped, I knew what would happen to me. Tree branches cut my face and barbed wire scratched my thighs. My feet and toes were bloody from running on gravel. The blood from the staff member's pinky finger dripped down from my mouth, staining my chin and chest. I was running for my life with scratches and cuts all over my body. If I were to get caught, I would be killed. If my pursuer had any sense, then I would be killed after being tortured. But if he didn't, I would be killed on the spot. I don't, I, didn't, I don't want to be killed. I don't want to be killed. My lungs and heart were about to explode. My mind was blank from fear and lack of oxygen. I was about to lose consciousness. I might have given in if I didn't hear the voice of a staff member coming after me. My knees were shaking. My legs wouldn't move properly. I felt like I was going to fall like a puppet with its strings cut, but I couldn't fall. I couldn't fall just yet. It was too late. My face hit the had hit the gravel. I felt the awful sensation of falling, and immediately after, the roar of the beast coming from behind me. Oh, she did. She bit off his fucking finger, or a good part, or, or a significant portion of it. Oh, Jesus. Oh. I must have hit my thigh against the steering wheel when I jumped. 
I can feel the throbbing pain delayed slightly. I'm sweating all over. I wipe the sweat from my forehead and put my hand on my chest, only then realizing how fast my heart was beating. I rubbed my thigh. I rubbed it in a straight line. It was not where I hit the steer. It was, that's not where I hit the steering wheel, but I felt like this is where it hurts. I can't see the scary beast in the moonlight in the moonlit car. I have I have my shoes on and I'm not covered in blood. My toes are fine too. Someone knocked on the window, startling me. Sansa, time this. I wanted to take a nap, so I told him to come wake me up in an hour. Maybe an hour was too long. Too long a nap actually makes you tired. I put my seat back up and got out of the car. The cool breeze feels good on my skin. I only see the moon. There's nothing else to see on this mountain trail. My car and a command vehicle disguised as a trailer are parked on the side of the street. I can still feel the bad taste in my mouth. I spat it out on the side of the street. But even that couldn't get rid of it. The taste of blood, saliva, and rain. Sweat from my forehead and raindrops got into my mouth, but I couldn't swallow, so I ended up drooling. That sensation around my lips brought back memories, and I tried to wipe my mouth. Maybe I'm nervous. That's why I had such a bad dream. I think there's a coffee machine in the command vehicle. An unpleasant cup of coffee will wake me up. どう何か動けるいえ何もそう。ねえ、どなたかコーヒーを入れてくださらないはい。ミルクと砂糖。ミルクだけ。あ、やっぱり砂糖も入れてください。she very clearly said milk, not cream. Just pointing that out. I still have a bad taste in my mouth. The feeling of biting and crushing his little finger and his, filth and his filthy blood filling my mouth. I'm sure a sweeter cup of coffee will wash down the bad taste and also wake me up from my nightmare completely. Look at Sayara over here feeling sorry for Takano. You can just feel it. You can feel it. He's he's letting go of that hatred. I can feel it. He's totally letting go. Do you need tips? I don't think we get any tips. I don't think this chapter... I don't think this even has tips this time around. <laughs> Alright, that one was kind of short. So I'm going to go be back in like two or three minutes and then we'll do another one. Alright? Everybody good for another one? We'll do another one. I'll tough it out. I'm not a weenie. Be right back. Couple minutes.
All right, I'm back. I will wait till everybody else is back, uh, and then we'll get uh, we'll, we'll get started on our second chapter. You're working on a picture. You're doing a drawing. Yeah, like jalapenos is like the only thing <clears throat> about that dish that I think is 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 worthwhile. Uh, well, I like cottage cheese as well. Uh, not together though. Not together. <laughs> yep, that was Beat's disaster. Care of one John Thire for those. I had to remind everybody that this is a horror series, right? <clears throat> Tang root beer and absinthe? Nice. You got seven cases of beets today? <clears throat> Holy shit. All right. Let's get this going before allergies decide to kill me further. We already saved, right? Yeah, we're good. Boom. All right, here we go. Hi, banquet to yori kouho. Speech, I'm just one of the campaign to enter. Ready, ready, ready. Kouho, okay, this. How come these incidental characters get voiceover, and the girls escaping with Takano don't? Are you for real right now? Live, I can't hear anything. Young Alto Young hotel workers dressed smartly in bow ties pulled bottle after bottle out of the beer cases, preparing them for the toast. They waited for their cue to serve the drinks while listening through the intercom. At a normal party, they could put bottles of beer on the table ahead of time, but if there was a lecture before the party, then they couldn't. Guests don't mind sushi going dry due to a long speech, but they don't like seeing their tables get wet with condensation from bottles of beer. And more than anything, they certainly don't want to drink warm beer. That's why beer has to be served right before a toast. However, there's always a speech before a toast, and usually a long one, especially at a big party like this. So there are lots of guests to give speeches, so it's extremely difficult to know when to, what to, ser when to serve. For that reason, the bottles end up sitting outside of the by the banquet room. <clears throat> <laughs> I'm assume that is a doll's host. Yes, that is a doll's host. Dolls, dolls, dolls. Thank you so much for the host. Much appreciated. Hope Chrono Cross continued treating you well. We are we, we're getting into the final arc of Higurashi, or at least the final mainline original arc. Uh, there are obviously more things going on in this story, but. This is the the final main arc that we're gonna see of this series for a while. So, hope you're doing well. Hope everybody from Dolls Chat's doing well. Bunch of lovely people. <clears throat> there were several dozen tables with white tablecloths on them in the banquet room. Approximately eight people were sitting at each table, so there were at least a few hundred people in the room. The banquet room was filled with excitement. There were many plates with many different kinds of food on each table. A sushi platter, a sashimi platter, a fruit platter. I want to go to this meeting right the fuck now. Also along the wall, there were cooks ready to serve fresh sashimi. Get me to this meeting, please. All the guests appeared to be well-mannered gentlemen and were clearly notable people in various uh, different fields. The huge and beautiful chandelier above, the, uh, above them clearly indicated that this hotel had a status good enough for these famous people. An elderly gentleman was giving a lengthy speech on stage before making a toast. Usually people don't like such long speeches, especially if it's before a toast. But the guests occasionally shouted, yes, yes, and sometimes gave him loud applause, filling the room with their fervor. Well, maybe fervor was a pleasant way to <laughs> Zeramis, thank you for the raid. Wow, much appreciated. 
Hey, hey, Liz. Wow, look at this. So many cool peeps stopping by. Little old me tonight. Very much appreciated. Testing your stream and people showed up. Nice. Well, I appreciate you throwing it over my way. Unfollowed me. You unfollowed me? You unfollowed me? Listen here, you little motherfucker. Listen here. Are you listening? I need confirmation that you're listening. Give me confirmation in my chat on twitch.tv that you are listening to the words coming out of my mouth right now, Zeramus Chan. Hi. How you doing? Hope you're doing well. I'm just playing with you. You know that. Uh, but we are playing uh, Higurashi. Uh, this is the final arc. Uh, there are eight arcs. There are eight video games, and we are on the last one. So me trying to catch you up with all that, if you don't already know it, gonna be real effing hard. But I appreciate you stopping by just the same. <laughs> I don't know why I called you Zeramus Chan. I really don't, but we don't try to understand the dumb shit that falls out of my mouth sometimes, but I appreciate you stopping by nonetheless. <laughs> yeah, everything is horrible and terrible all the time. The series. Yeah, that's basically it. Nerd basically just summed up Higurashi when they cry. <laughs> I'm gonna start doing it too. I'm just gonna start calling him Zar Zeramus Chan all the time now. <laughs> that's right, that's right. <laughs> oh no, are we in the now? Oh no! I, I take it back. I don't want to be in this meeting room. They're this is where the ultra nationalists are, and I don't want to be anywhere around these people. That's what's going on here, isn't it? Oh no, we're no, we don't want to be a nationalist. No. They lulled me in with a false sense of sushi and sashimi, everybody. I don't want to be a nationalist, I swear to Christ. Uh, to know ourselves, to know our culture, to understand our history and our country itself. Those are the things that make you realize that you are a Japanese citizen, that make you understand the part you play as a citizen of this country, and the feeling you get from that love towards your own country. However, those anti-Japan teachers are proclaiming that it's a militaristic brainwashing. Those stupid claims are wrong. What are those people doing anyway? They're teaching our children to hate being Japanese. They're the ones brainwashing them with this self-destructive education. Is this sounding a little familiar to anybody right now in the year 2020, the year of our Lord in uh, the United States right now? Ooh, makes you kind of like want to pull the old shirt collar out a little bit and just give a whoo, whoo. They are teaching our children that Japan, Japan should be ashamed of itself and that they should be ashamed of being Japanese. Forget who you are and deny your country. That's what they're teaching them. These innocent children listen and believe such nonsense. Of course they do. They go to school to learn things, right? If their teachers teach them that, of course their children will believe it. Can you believe such corruption exists? We must do something about this country's education now, no matter what it takes. The sound of applause filled the banquet room. All the gentlemen agreed and expressed that they felt the same way by cheering him on. After that, a gentleman wearing a cloth sash approached the stage. The hall welcomed him onto the stage with another round of thunderous applause, a rousing theme from a popular drama series played as he looked, up, looked at the stage, but it was entirely unnecessarily before, unnecessary before the overwhelming applause. The man's sash carried his name written in large letters along with the name of the prefecture he was running, and running for office in. Oh god, Patri- they're calling themselves PATRIOTS! Also, I'm pretty sure that this part of the PS3 version is not voiced for this reason. I think this stuff is real taboo to talk about. <laughs> Let me introduce you to a patriot. Quadruple X-Coon. 
This man has served the former governor as his right-hand man as director of the office of the governor for many years, supporting that prefecture's government for a long time. Since the previous governor has decided to retire, he was appointed as the next governor. Unfortunately, we have these anti-Japan teachers in our prefecture. While they proclaim freedom of education and freedom of thought, they are shamelessly forcing an anti-Japan education down on our children. We must teach real history. They teach our children that everything was Japan's fault. Oh boy. Oh boy. Oh boy. They don't even mention the true purpose of the of the Greater East Asia Co-Prosperity Sphere or all those who fought to save Asian peoples in the we from Western control. They don't even talk about how Asian countries were actually Western colonies before Japan stood up for our freedom during the war. Our country was recovered amazingly since then, yet our children don't know any of that because these teachers don't teach them. How truly, truly sad. You, I can't stand the fact but those anti-Japan teachers are actually teaching our children alongside these teachers who take teaching seriously. They are insulting our educational institutions. Yeah, fantastic. I picked... I, 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 I may have made a boo-boo, but we're just going to stick with it. I will become a governor and get rid of those teachers. I will straighten out our education system and make sure our children will grow up to be decent young people who can carry Japan's future. He, Quadruple X Kun, announces his candidacy for the next year's prefectural governorship. We appreciate your support for him. I promise I will straighten out Japan's education system. Thank you for your support. Again, the banquet room filled with applause. The man was receiving a standing ovation. I need to explain a bit about this banquet before you misunderstand. It wasn't a conference of, political of, of a political association or a lecture by a political candidate. It was, hard, it was hard to believe, but this was nothing more than a meeting of a college's alumni association. Everyone should be familiar with what those are. Whether it's elementary school, junior high school, high school, or college, once you graduate from one of those, you normally belong to an organization of alumni. You receive invitations to reunions where you enjoy talking about the good old days. However, there are many different types of organizations. Some are simple, and some are united with much tighter bonds. And once an organization becomes united with those tight bonds, it's no longer a simple organization of alumni. Rather, it becomes a significant faction known as an alma mater, alma mater clique. In Japanese society, it's traditional for graduates to form tighter bonds that go beyond the level of an organization. Also, the more superior the alma mater, the stronger the tendency holds true. The Imperial University, one of the best universities in the country, is famous for the deep bonds its graduates form. Why do superior people like to bond? It may be because they take pride in being superior, but more than that, maintaining connections is the most significant reason. All Imperial University graduates are elites in their respective fields. Basically Danganronpa. <laughs> <clears throat> they are likely to succeed and become important people. When they do, the unity of their alumni association gains immeasurable meaning. In fact, even today, the Imperial University graduates maintain their tight academic clique, and they hold great influence throughout many different fields. They interact with other universities as well, so the graduates' bonds are extremely tight, even today. Additionally, while Imperial University usually refers to the University of Tokyo, sometimes it's, it's used to mean all seven major universities in Japan. They're located in Tokyo, Kyoto, Toku, Kyushu, Hokkaido, Osaka, and Nagoya. They are all great schools. There happens to be an organization of alumni that includes all, includes all of those seven universities. The elderly gentlemen in this banquet room were each from one of those organizations. However, not every graduate would get an invitation here automatically. It is a society of select gentlemen, and in order to become a member, one must first fulfill several conditions, such as a recommendation from an existing member, contribution to the society, possession of status, and so forth. Therefore, all the members are important people from different fields, and obviously the power of this organization is of a political nature. But there's one very important criterion that, that, that one has to meet to join. Strong patriotism. A heart that longs to contribute to Japan and its rebirth. As a result, this organization has become extremely nationalistic. 
Up on the stage, the candidate for the prefectural governor governorship was still ta talking passionately, and among those elderly gentlemen in the crowd, Takano could be found. Takano seemed used to this kind of conference and seemed unsurprised at anything that was said, but at the same time, she looked rather fed up with it. As she was in attendance, she must have been one of their members, which meant she possessed not only an extremely excellent academic background, but that the order, but that the older gentleman here had acknowledged her equivalent contributions to society and that she possessed strong patriotism. I mean, that's how cool Takano is. She gets into the boys' club. She was, she's the type that gets into the boys' club, or she's going to put together a very, a very well put together plan to destroy your little club. <laughs> I imagine it went something like that. However, her academic background was the only qualification she had met to join. She was only able to join as a special case because of her connections. She didn't even hold a prejud the prejudiced ideas like the other members did. Okay, you know what? At least Takano is not a nationalist. We can at least, we can at least take that off of the table for the bad things that she has done. At least she's probably not a big old xenophobe. <laughs> she didn't even hold the prejudiced ideas like the other members did. So why was she here today? Probably because of the same reason that the man giving the speech up on stage. The man on the stage didn't actually have prejudiced ideas, much like Takano. He only prepared a speech that he knew he, he, that he knew the guests would like. Politicians only want votes. Each and every person has a vote, but appealing to each one of them takes too long. So the most efficient way is to appeal to organizations with unified idea and a unified will. In other words, this man was giving his speech so he can garner support from those powerful people. The elderly gentlemen in the banquet room will then do their best to support him since he appears to share their ideals. <laughs> yeah, she hates everyone equally. <laughs> They can offer many different kinds of expediency, support, and assistance. To an outrageous degree, I might add. If, that, if, if the day's event continued the same way, the organization would likely decide to officially support him. They will probably give him a great deal of financial aid. They'll assist him in different ways as well. Of course, the man on the stage won't be the only one gaining something. When he wins the, the election and becomes a governor next year, the organization will welcome the governor as a new member and gain even more political influence. And eventually, the organization will become so powerful that nobody can ignore it. Those of you reading this right now probably get the sense that they're no more that they're that they're no mere alumni association. You'd be absolutely right. After reaching this level, they were a f they were a fine syndicate. No, they would, be, they would be a secret society if the group wasn't so open about its activities. Now, I'm sure some of you readers are brushing this off, thinking there's no way such a suspicious organization could exist in Japan. But everything I've explained is entirely true. There are several such influential groups and organizations within our society, and you need to understand that they hold powerful political clout and influence our national policies. Oh boy, this is just so on the nose it hurts oh god some are alma mater cliques like the one i've described above others are scientific societies serving different parties industrial groups advisory committees religious organizations community service groups and so forth <laughs> this is just japan also, there are right wings and left wings, and uh, also there are right wings and left wings, the hawk and the dove. I won't go listing their specific names here, yet you've probably heard them every now and again on your average newspaper. In Japan, the terms for such forces aren't very common. Most of you readers probably think of a suspicious organization wearing white hoods when you, wear, when you hear the phrase secret society and laugh it off, but unfortunately, that's a huge mistake. In America, where there's far more territory and citizens, there's way more groups like that, and they possess such vast influence that ignoring them is impossible. Oh boy. Oh boy! So the terms they use for such forces don't apply to those on the scale of this syndicate. Sometimes people say that such groups have more power than the White House, and that they're referred to as a shadow government. Even here in Japan, we had a shadow government before the war, our Zaibatsu. 
After we lost the war, the GHQ dismantled those blocks, and but 40 years have passed since then. There's no guarantee our country hasn't given birth to another shadow government, given how good we are at collusion, groundwork, and backroom deals. Mio Takano was, in fact, attending a conference of such a shadow government. Takano, are you doing a shadow government? Takano! Takano! It might appear to be a guest house at a huge golf course. There were no golfers in sight, but, it, but by appearances, that this must be it. But appearances can be deceiving. There wasn't a golf course, but a huge backyard. The guest house was, in fact, a very stylish mansion. Normally, normal people would be surprised to learn that this was a private residence. The interior of the building was, lav was as lavish as the exterior. There were beautiful carpets on every floor, expensive looking decorations on the wall, and expensive looking bottles of alcohol on the shelves. That's the kind of room Takano was in. There was a knock at the door, and an old man in a wheelchair and a young woman pushing it entered. As Takano stood up to bow, the old man stopped her by raising his right hand. <laughs> The old man sat down on the sofa with the assistance from a woman. He was very old. His face was covered with wrinkles and he could hardly do anything on his own. Even so, he still held a great deal of power and influence. <laughs> there was no lipstick on his neck. The woman who was helping him with the wheelchair was too beautiful to be a mere helper, so Takano had suspected something. As it turned out, her guess was correct. Although he was so old that he could die the next day, he wanted to stay sexually active until the very end. Even the Grim Reaper would think that's just absurd. <笑>おい先短い年寄りに触らせても減るもんではないに I don't know. Self-respect? <laughs> we are Mio Takano right now. We are talking about soft butts, everybody. Just want to put that out there. Mio Takano, soft butts. That's where we're at. Takano and the old man enjoyed a tasteless conversation. They had clearly known each other for a long time and were very close. The young woman came back in to serve tea. After she left, the old man started to speak. しかし、ミオちゃんは本当に立派な子だのう。高野くんもこれほど立派に育ってくれて、きっとあの世で花高々だろうな。そうであればいいのですが、祖父の異業には私など足元にも及びません。高野君もいろいろと運がなかった。時代にも恵まれんかった。もし何もない時代に研究をしておったなら、あんたに引き継がせることもなく見事研究を完成させておっただろうの。ですが、そういう時代だったからこそ、皮肉にも祖父は雛
In the middle of the 20th century, despite rising tensions between East and West, there was a contemporary peace known as the Cold War brought <clears throat> known as the Cold War brought, bal brought by a balance of nuclear weapons pointed at one another. Permanent memberships in the United Nations were monopolized by nations with nuclear arms. They secured their predominance with nuclear weapons, bound but <clears throat> bound the world with nuclear non-proliferation non treaties, eternally banning non-nuclear nations from the world stage. For Japan to become a nation that can compete with the world, it must develop nuclear arms or something as powerful. That was, that was what some believed, at least. Realistically, Japan will never arm itself with nuclear weapons. I know. The citizens wouldn't accept it. Even if the government ignored their opinions and armed itself with nuclear weapons, it wouldn't work. By abandoning nuclear weaponry, Japan gained the deterrent power of the United States. Though some people thought that the only way for Japan to become equal to the United States would be to, would be to get nuclear arms of their own, but realistically, that was impossible. Even if Japan armed itself with nuclear weapons, that wouldn't automatically let Japan join the great powers. Takano and the old man discussed the balance of nuclear power in the world. Eventually, the sound of the cuckoo clock rema reminded them that it was time to re them to return to the main subject at hand. The old man pointed to the attaché case that had been sitting next to Takano. Takano nodded once, opened it up, and removed the contents. <laughs> there were brand new bills packed in it. How much was actually in there? A bundle of brand new million yen bills is one centimeter, so there must have been at least enough to make up eight digits. There were also two more attaché cases by her side, however neither Takano nor the old man were surprised at all. Takano closed the attaché case and opened uh, and bowed. <laughs> well, that's never going to be said by anybody old in America. That's for sure. Oh, that's never getting said by any old person in America. Ever! <laughs> Never! Never! もちろんですわ。祖父の夢を実現するためだけに使います。高野君が羨ましいの。良いお孫さんを持たれた。きっとあの世であんたを自慢しているだろうの。<laughs> yeah, we're back to being certain this is fiction. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Like, that's right. Like, that's right. その儲けた金で、お国のために何を貢献できるかが大切なんだ。それこそが、今日まで自分を育んでくれたお国への恩返し注文なんだがのう。Getting あいつらが買い物をすれば、金は巡って奥にに戻る。オッケー、オッケー。オッケー。あ、who女どもにばらまく金と、みおちゃんに託す金は意味が全く違う。え、存じております。みおちゃんは今日までよく頑張ってきた。礼を尽くし、大勢の人たちの信用と支持を取り付けた。今だから話すが、春山君も望月君も。最初は君のことを若すぎると批判的だったんだがね。だから私もミオちゃんのその努力を認めてその金を託すんだ。They <laughs> have softer butts. 
そしてなその金を私が託すつ私がミオちゃんを高野くんの研究の正式な後継者だと認めたということなんだありがとうございます私ごとき弱敗に委ねてくださったことに深く感謝いたしますいやいやこれは高野くんと君の研究だ彼もミオちゃん以外が引き継ぐことを望まなかっただろうのだからミオちゃんがここまで上り詰めたおかげで他の年寄りたちをより説得しやすかったわけだ祖父の完成できなかった研究を私が完成させることだけが私ができる祖父への唯一の恩返しですからそのために求められる努力ならばいといませんタカノスマイルシュー remembered everything she had to go through to get to this point It went without saying, but the old men around Tokyo, the, the old men around Takano saw her as someone from their grandchildren's generation, or maybe even younger. Just how much trouble did Takano have to endure in order to gain the trust of those with such a large generational gap? It was hard to describe to those who couldn't even imagine her trouble, but Takano earned it. She gathered allies, drove away enemies, garnered support, and forced them to recognize her. She spent a long time establishing trust and rising to a status. That the old men would welcome. Which was all the more reason this meeting was a reward for her many days of hardship. Now that, she was, now that she officially had a powerful influence backing her, she could spread her wings and see the completion of her grandfather's unfinished research. Sate, Takano kun no kenkyu o seishiki ni hikitsugu koto ni natta nara, Mio chan ni mo hanashite o kanakya naran koto ga aru. Nan de shou? The old man paused and pulled out an expensive cigarette from the cigarette holder on the table. Takano lit it up for him. She didn't smoke herself, but knowing that the old man did, she kept the lighter in her pocket. The constant buildup of little gestures like that were how she gained the trust she held today. Takano kun noticed the Hinamazawa syndrome in Manchuria, not Japan. Yes, according to my grandfather's journal, around 1940, he learned that many soldiers sent from Hinamazawa to the, <clears throat> to the Kwantung army expressed, expressed terminal symptoms, which led them to surmise that an unknown infectious parasite dwelled in Hinamazawa. Under the harsh conditions of war, people sometimes lost their mind. In those conditions, those, were, in those, conditions, those who were sent To a far off battlefield from Hinamazawa, spent their days under duress, and occasionally they exhibited terminal symptoms, hallucinated, and caused twisted incidents. Yet that all occurred to, in an extensive, an extensive chaos in the battle. Yet, all, yet that all occurred in the extensive chaos in the battlefield. Every incident was handled separately, and no one suspected there was an underlying cause. Toji Takano k u n 軍医少佐として海外に派兵されていて現地の貿易研究所で各種伝染病の予防対策について研究していたそんな中で偶然いくつかの錯乱事件が全て同じ出身地の兵士によって起こされていることを知った高野君は雛見沢出身者に特有の症状ではないかと仮定し個人的にこの研究を始めたのだそしてひなみざわ出身の兵士を研究所勤務にして集めいろいろと調査したそしてひなみざわ独特の親城様信仰の存在を知り得意な性質を持つ未知の疾病の存在を確信したのだ Some may wonder how he could be so certain that these symptoms were caused by unusual parasites. At the beginning of the 20th century, German doctors proved that some unknown diseases were caused by bacteria and parasites. At the time, it wasn't too far of a jump to assume that unknown pathogens could be behind unknown diseases. For instance, in modern times, it's been revealed that beriberi is caused by vitamin B1 deficiency. It is the start of The 20th century, many loudly proclaimed that it was the work of an unidentified pathogen. So, the scientists were told that 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 the s c i e n t i s t 
As a researcher, her grandfather was very talented and passionate, but when it came to gaining the aid of political powers, he simply struck out. Hinamazawa syndrome. No, the possible existence of a parasite that infected the human brain and controlled emotions. Even though he made the remarkable achievement of discovering a mystery no one had, expla no one had explained before him, he was unable to convince others that the achievement and <clears throat> of that achievement and spent his life alone, unable to garner support and unable to achieve proper recognition for his achievement. Independent research has its limit. Talented people, funding, and backup. A research project can be successful only if all those things are present. Takano had noticed her grandfather's mistakes, and that was why she did everything she could to obtain all of that. ですが。当時の上層部は速攻性でしかも不変性の高い治療薬を期待していた。高野くんの研究は非常に興味深いものではあっても、当時の軍には期待されなかったということだの。ですが。先生は唯一祖父の研究に理解を示してくれたと聞いています。祖父は先生のことを無二の親友と記していました。Well, if you want to do a big old crime like Takano wants to do, you got to get paid to do it. That kind of that kind of setup and payload delivery don't come cheap. Takano-kun とは同郷だった。同じそば屋を知る人間と遠方の戦地で会えるというのは奇跡的なことだったの。彼とは年は離れていたが、私たちは固い友情で結ばれていたのだ。だから高野くんからはよく話をされたの。画期的な研究になるに違いない本格的な
With the Soviet Union and its predecessor Russia being landlocked, frozen being a landlocked frozen nation, they had long yearned for an ice-free port that wouldn't freeze over in winter. They had made numerous attempts to expand their territory southward too. Those expansionist policies were said to be the cause of the Russo-Japanese War. And the history books had said that Japan won the Russo-Japanese War, but it was actually a draw ending in peace signed by the Treaty of Portsmouth. <laughs> Both sides had simply set aside their spears after mutually exhausting their forces. It wasn't like Russia capitulated and offered a complete surrender, and as a result, the perception of the Russian threat continued to smolder. Later, the Russian Empire was overthrown by a revolution, but Japan was unable to shake the threat that the new Soviet Union would advance south. According to history books, Japan went south. They signed the Soviet-Japanese Neutrality Pact and abandoned the, north, and abandoned, and abandoned the northern advance. As a result, with the, Great Potomac, uh, with the Great Patriotic War began, the Soviet Union was able to respond to the pressure of the, government fr uh, of the German front by pouring in their eastern, by pouring in their eastern horses. <laughs> Though the Germans had managed to lay siege to Moscow, the Soviets launched a massive counteroffensive that reversed the tides of the war. Even with the Soviet-Japanese neutrality pact, the Soviets couldn't tell if Japan would attack them at some point. Because of the threat, the Soviets had to leave some forces in the Far East, and they weren't able to devote enough troops to the German front. For starters, the Soviets had forged the Germany, the Germany, so the motherfucker, Jesus Christ! This chapter is making me want to die. <laughs> For starters, the Soviets had forged the Germany-Soviet non-aggression pact too. Yes, Germany broke the treaty and attacked the Soviet Union. To make matters worse, Japan and Germany had forged a military alliance. With all those factors in play, the Soviets naturally couldn't trust Japan to uphold their neutrality pact. Yeah, it's just, there's so much here! Ugh! And I've got allergies literally destroying me right now. It's fucking misery. I want to die. Ugh! Ironically, the Soviet Union was the one who broke the pact, but I won't go into that now. Thank you! Exactly. Hitler signs the... Hitler signed the tripart... Oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> Hitler signed that pact because he expected Japan to keep the Soviets' other front in check. But ultimately, Japan abandoned the North. With the superior German, with the superior German offensive, many supported the idea of waiting and watching it play out. Then they believe... Then... Oh, God. They believed that even if we did advance north, that it would, I would, after Germany conquered Moscow. However, that plan was exposed to Sorge, and the Soviets transferred their heavy tanks from the Far East border to the German front. <clears throat> that secured Germany's defeat at Moscow, and the Germans began seeing a string of defeats, starting with the Battle of Kursk. It was a turning point in history, huh? During the Cold War, the Soviet Union was recognized as a global power, but at least in 1940, the Kwantang Army didn't think it was a particular threat. Japan had earned its victory with the Russo-Japanese War, and they took with a new Soviet and they took the new Soviet Union government lightly, assuming it would be it wouldn't be able it wouldn't be stable after overthrowing the Russian Empire. God, kill me, please! Somebody, kill me! Uh, that underestimation was corrected uh, with the no with the Nomohan incident in 1941. Ah, uh, I'm not enjoying this. I'm, I, I literally don't care about this. Ah, uh, God. Like, dude, point to a history book or something. Fucking this. Condense this! Like, Jesus Christ, man. Fuck, I'll be right back.
All right, uh, back to uh, the history lesson that we all signed up for. I'm sure we'll get back to the visual novel at some point, uh, but right now we are in a, we are in history class. After several fierce short-term battles, the Soviet Union's advanced mechanized corps that led to great losses, the Kwantang army realized they shouldn't fight the Soviets and that inclined Japan toward the Soviet-Japanese neutrality pact. But it, oh God. But at the very least, up until the Nomahan incident, the Kwantang army was strongly conscious of the Soviets and decided on advancing north or south. Thanks to that, there were also voices advising caution, suggesting we avoid all-out war with China in order to shore up the forces against the Soviets. But the Sino-Japanese war broke out after the Marco Polo Bridge incident, right? Oh, are we going to explain this incident too? I hate being this negative, but good god, this, this is... There's a reason this isn't voiced and a reason it was excised from the other versions of the game. I'm just going to say that. Ugh, God, this is just bad. This is just too fucking bogged down. Yes, we're going to explain the bridge incident! Thank God, I'm so fucking happy! July 1957, the Japanese and Chinese army were staring at each other across the Lugao Bridge in Beijing. It was the middle of the night on July 7th. The Chinese army fired the Japanese army in training and they engaged in combat. This triggered the long Sino-Japanese War. Yes, according to the historical records, the incident triggered the Sino-Japanese War, but with opinions divided over advancing north and south, the army was equally divided over the full-scale confrontation with China. No, in fact, we even received orders from the General Staff Headquarters to resolve the matter quietly before the incident grew much bigger. <sighs> so those supporting the Northern Advance wanted to settle for the Battle of Lugao. The battle bridge quietly insisting that the conflict with China was pointless in light of their anti-Soviet strategy. However, those in the mainland supporting the Southern Advance issued... Blah, blah, blah. They ended up... Oh, God. <laughs> They're still going. Man, this is... You can't make this entertaining. You just can't. You can't sit here as the reader and make anybody care about this. They enacted hard policies against China, and thus the Marco Polo Bridge incident became the trigger for the Japan and China to enter all-out war. After that, and their bitter struggles, the no Mahong Kanzana Japan revised their Soviet strategy, they signed the Soviet-Japanese Neutrality Pact and secured around... All of this to say... We need Hinamazawa Syndrome as a bioterrorism weapon. That's all we needed to say here! Ugh, the Sino-Japanese War got worse and worse, and so did the fucking narrative. Yeah, if the Marco Polo Bridge incident hadn't happened, it's possible that history would have gone very differently. Maybe we could have ended up in a war with them anyway. However, if the South faction didn't get the chance, the military authorities would have kept would have kept re restraining the Soviet Union. The Soviets would have had. Oh God! I... I'm pressing the button, and you're reading. I can't read this out loud. I hate it. <laughs> I'm sorry. I try to get through this, but I, I can't. I can't read this. I don't want to fucking read this out loud. Oh, please tell us how Napoleon uh, occupied Moscow as well. I think we need that as well. Can we go to Wikipedia and look that up too?
Like, I get why this is important context, but these characters aren't going to sit around and talk about this history lesson that they read in a social studies book like this. This just doesn't work for this scene. Like, maybe if you're doing it with the narrative text, it makes sense? But having these characters sit around and talk like a history book? This does not work or make sense as a scene at all. Like, this is miserable writing. What does this have to do with my grandfather? I've been asking myself that question for the last 20 fucking minutes. Of course. You see, you could have explained this in maybe 20 text boxes and not literally 20 minutes of the entire history of the war. Maybe, I don't know. I think you could have made that I think you could have made that land with just a simple explanation. Yeah, like, this part was not excised because of the war. This part was excised because it's fucking boring and they couldn't, they literally couldn't pay these voice actors to voice it. They looked at it and said, I'm not reading a fucking history book. Look how seamless they worked back into this! They know! They know! Yeah, like, hey, do you remember the MP bridge incident? Yeah, somebody fired a shot at the start of the war, blamed the other side. Yep, it turns out the guy was the side of the Himazawa Itis. Exactly, boom, there you go. That's all you had to do. This, and that did not need to be 20 minutes of history on the fucking war. Soda. And then you pop right back into this seamlessly. Takano-kun,にその気はなくとも、ひなみざわ昇降軍の研究が大やけになれば、社会的 Takana tried to remain calm, but she couldn't stop herself from grimacing. She had just found out the real reason why her grandfather's research had been ignored. It was because of secret maneuvers by political masterminds. If those masterminds feared it so much, ironically, that meant they acknowledged the importance of his research. Takana was saddened and frustrated to no end by her grandfather's lonely life. <laughs> まだ高野君が生きていたなら私はそれを誤って全面的な協力を申し出るつもりだった
ったが彼はもういないだから私はミオちゃんに謝り高野君にするはずだった協力を君にしようと思っているのだよろしいのですか私が雛見沢症候群の研究をすることで蒸し返しになるということはありませんかもう当時とは時代が違うそれに雛見沢症候群の研究には単なるフード病では済まされないものが潜んでおる You remember last arc how Rika did a, a Metal Gear Solid scene by herself and it wasn't terrible? How did we get this after that? Like, man, just wow, wow! 研究によっては医学の名前がつくあらゆる学会がひっくり返るような大発見になるかもしれん。当時とはもう風向きが変わったということですよねそうだ不幸にも高野くんは風向きが変わるまで存命することができなかっただが幸いミオちゃんという後継者に研究を託せただから私はこの命ある限りミオちゃんの研究を最大限応援する私は高野くんに協力を約束したのにさまざまなしがらみから力になれず彼を失望させたその償いを命ある限りしていこうと思っている Yeah like this is this and Takano's speech at the end of the previous arc like that's like two of the most egregious Points of just like, let's get on with it. Like, that's just man. I don't understand needing that large of a history lesson. And for these,、uh, again, for these characters to be mouthpiecing it the way they were, that was just terrible writing. The Mahjong game was fun, though. The Mahjong game was fun. There was interesting kinetic energy happening there, and they made that work. Like the rooftop scene with Keiichi and Rena was literally like 50 minutes, but it was insane! Because they weren't just two characters standing there being talking heads for a Wikipedia article. Yeah, yeah. 私も死ぬ前に洗いざらいを話せてすっきりしたとにかく私の目が黒いうちはミオちゃんの研究に一切の不自由はさせん何かあったらいつでも頼りなさい助力は惜しまないからの Takano couldn't even imagine what kind of bond this old man and her grandfather had between them. But thanks to that bond, Takano was able to gain a powerful supporter. Tears welled up in Takano's eyes as she gave him an emotional look, but in her mind, she was practically dancing at the promise of this old man's full support. The old man and Takano both bowed at the same time to show each other their appreciation. Once that was done, the old man became a little more serious. After that far too lengthy preamble, After that far too lengthy preamble. After that far too lengthy preamble. He finally said what he really wanted to tell her. So you could do that. What I see, I eat, I know, at the money. He now is a show called good. You are. Lake she slam or scurry can and I marry a cougar yard or tail to you. Got to that. それは日本社会すらもねじ曲げかねないそこのところをよく肝に銘じて慎重に研究をしなさいあとでプロライダーフィニッシュサーヴィングのフードシーバー The room was very tastefully put together, reminding them of a tea ceremony room. While it was sparsely decorated, quite a bit of money had obviously gone into it. 
This was a very famous Japanese restaurant where many high up officials and other important people held secret meetings. Takano was there, accompanied by about five gentlemen. She was sitting slightly further away from the men. They had clearly, they were, they were, cle they were, they were clearly in a much more important position than she was. One of the men, wearing an expensive double-breasted suit, told Takano not to be so nervous. <laughs> Exactly. I wouldn't want to be around these tights anyway. And nothing was left after the U.S. military confiscated even the fundamental research. なるほど。故に誰にも知られず、そして誰の追求も受けなかったというわけですな。その意味において<笑> Takano adored Takano Hifumi and called him, and called him grandfather, but she hadn't revealed their relationship to others. She realized it wouldn't be beneficial for people to think she was involving personal feelings in her continuing Dr. Takano's research. So publicly, she once, she once had exchanges with Takano Hifumi, and after his death, discovered his research documents with his remains and chose to carry it on. At least that's how the story went. Uh, just two. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know, right? <laughs> I'll pretend this is not a personal issue by taking his name. <laughs> There's a research council for next generation deterrence being led by experts for several different ministries. There was no way she would know about something like that, but it was very possible for these nationalists to research something dangerous without citizens knowing about it. Society forms something like a web made of connections between people. People hold hands with other people who share the same ideas and end up knitting a net. Of course, some nets are well known, but others are secret ones too. <clears throat> so there was no way of, of guessing just how the men of this meeting were connected. <clears throat> A society involving research into deterrent weapons for the next generation, the Alphabet Project. With those words, it was possible to imagine what that might entail. Deterrent weapons. That usually refers to nuclear technology. Weapons are normally used to destroy enemies, however the general idea of deterrent weapons is very different. The assumption is that they won't actually be used against anyone. Nuclear weapons are largely used as a threat to prevent enemy invasion. Both the US and Soviets possess large stockpiles of nuclear arms keeping each other in check, but they will never actually use them. Because if they did, there'd be a nuclear war and both countries would be destroyed. So they're like a legendary weapon you never draw. Of course, that last resort only works because both sides have nuclear weapons. If one side lacks them, then they, use, then they lose all military negotiation power. In other words, nations without nukes are powerless b before nuclear armed states. That can't be true. Japan abandoned nukes and it still functions as a nation today. Or some people may be thinking, but they're wrong. Japan abandoned nukes, but lies under the nuclear umbrella by allying itself with America. That means that, <clears throat> that means that the nation functions thanks to America's nukes. However, that also means we must resign ourselves to forever being a vassal, for, to forever being a vassal of America. 
In order for Japan to, to escape that and become a powerful nation equal to America, it must possess its own deterrence arms and step out of a nuclear umbrella. That, so that society must have been put together by experts who believe in that ideal. Given that, even the name Alphabet Project makes sense. Nuclear weapons are weapons of mass destruction. However, weapons of mass destruction aren't always nuclear. They also include biological weapons and chemical weapons. Atomic, biological, chemical, and the initials of those three words that make up ABC. You sons of bitches. Jesus Christ. That's why weapons of mass destruction are sometimes called ABC weapons. I won't go into weapons of mass destruction that don't belong in these three categories. ABC, alphabet. In other words, alphabet project. Must be code for research into weapons of mass destruction. How come we couldn't get this quick and snappy of a discussion about the fucking war? How come we needed 20 minutes for that, but you'd be like, look, ABC, those are weapons and bad. Son of a bitch. Yes, I'm still salty, okay? As it happened, these guests of Takano's were correct. By rights, Japan should possess nuclear arms. We established ourselves as a peace-loving nation after the war, and after vast international contributions, we've been recognized as a permanent member of the UN. Yet until we possess nuclear arms, we won't be recognized as a proper nation, as the long-held desire of post-war Japan. Exactly. However, realistically, thanks to the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, the major organizations, the na major nations hold a monopoly on nukes. Worse, our domestic public opinion is growing allergic to nukes, so foreign and domestic pressures make implementing them impossible. Biological and chemical weapons are sometimes known as the poor man's nuke. Small countries that can't own nuclear weapons have already started research into that kind of weaponry. Takano san, please don't misunderstand us, okay? The purpose of our research is to obtain a, it isn't to obtain a biological weapon. Instead, our goal is to prevent such weapons from coming to Japan from coming into Japan from other countries. So this research into self-defense, I want you to understand that. Oh uh, yes, I'm aware of that. Takano hated the ja this Japanese tendency to make excuses, but she didn't let it show on her face. No matter what they said, no matter what they said, they already saw the value in using this research toward biological weaponry. However, in truth, it was just an excuse as well. If they actually wanted to research biological weapons, then it would be much faster to research diseases like smallpox and anthrax instead of unidentified disease like Hinamazawa syndrome. So it wasn't actually correct to say the defense agency was interested in it as a biological weapon. In other words, Takano needed a powerful sponsor who could back her up with funding, personnel, and a facility to conduct her research. So she used her connections and turned to the old men behind the government and the economy, reaching out to each of them and getting them to forcibly pull funding out of the defense agency under the excuse of its application toward biological weaponry. That was the truth. Therefore, her project wasn't officially recognized by the defense agency. To be exact, the people who secretly controlled the defense agency were the ones who knew about it. These masterminds diverted funding from the defense agency to the Alphabet Project, and then they pushed for Takano's research to be a part of it. Takano gets her funding, and the influencers get to drain public funds through kickbacks. Considering that, it was doubtful this project was genuinely about researching the next generation of deterrence arms. It was probably just an excuse for the masterminds to funnel money into their own pockets. Well, those complicated matters didn't matter to Takano. Whatever those old men and influencers were planning wasn't her business. As long as she could get the funding for her research, that was enough. Either way, Takano had found her sponsor. It was one of the biggest organizations around, too. This had always been her grandfather's dream. Takano was trying to stay calm, and she was about to jump up and down in excitement. なかがくんとしては今回の件十分に研究が進んだら丸ごと買い取って構わないと言ってくれてるまだまだ未完の研究だがその将来性については十分に理解できてるようだおっしゃる通りですこの研究はまだ道半ばで十分な資金も施設
putting that put quite a damper on Takano's ecstasy. Takano realized she was talking rather than she, talk, Takano realized she was talking rather breathlessly, so she tried to calm herself down. Either way, they'd be they'd be backing the research, considering they're hoping for results that merit that, but merit the budget. They probably feel that Takano is still too young to handle it. ただの参加今日まで積み上げてきた研究を横から滑らわれたんじゃ。それはあんまりですからね。そこは私もよくわかってます。もちろん向こうにもそれは伝えました。それで出てきた設置案がこれです。まずアルファベットプロジェクト内
今日までのあなたとそしてこ高野先生の地道な研究が評価された結果ですいいえ全て高野先生の努力の成果です私などまだ何も<笑>謙虚なのは実にいいことです小泉先生もおっしゃっておられましたが本当に高野さんはいい方ですな可愛がられているというのもうなずけます、えー、それでですね向こうとしては高野さんの身分を防衛庁で預かってしまいたいようです幸い高野さんは医師免許をお持ちですからね研究本部の遺憾として身分を保証するようです公務員になれということですかこれは意外な話ですねアルファベットプロジェクトに携わる研究機関のほとんどは公的機関です今回の研究は陸自も強い関心を寄せており職員を陸自から派遣したいと強く要望してきていますですので場合によっては身分は陸自の扱いになるかもしれませんまあこの辺は役人の縄張り争いだと思ってくださいその役人たちの上に立つには役人の身分が必要になってくるとそういうわけですなもちろんどういう形になろうとも高野さんが I think that's how she's going to wrangle herself a major position. Wakarimashita. So no other way, Omakase itashimas. Shikashi, Takano sensei ga katsute gun ni, kono kenkyu no enjo o motometa toki ni wa kotowarareta koto o moto. Boe chow ga kyo mi o shime sarata no ga igai to yuka, osoi to yuka. Fukuzat na kimochi desu ne. So da shikata arimasu mai na. With the war situation worsening, the Japanese military has sought something with the immediate effect, something that could turn the war around. That wasn't true, of course. Takano already heard the confession from the old man. She exhaled. To her, this was like a meeting in front. The meeting in front of her wasn't ha was happening somewhere far away. She had longed for this day to come and worked so hard to reach it. Finally, her grandfather and his research were attaining recognition. This was the day she had dreamed of. She, so she was frightened just imagining that it might be an actual dream. True joy can't be felt all at once. Oftentimes, it's a delayed reaction. Takano thought it must be exactly what she was feeling. I think it's probably not a second class of the second class. If you're going to be a second class, しい。高野三佐ですか。いやいや、羨ましいですな。男に生まれたからには一度くらいは自分のことを階級で呼ばれてみたいものですが。いやいやいやいやいや。高野三佐ですか。三佐。何ですか。ああ、自衛隊の階級のことで三島陸佐のことです。企業でいうところの副部長くらいでしょうね。おそらくその階級がプロジェクト発足時に高野さんに与えられることになるかと思います。昔でいうところの少佐ですよ。そういえば奇
She had only come so far. There were still a lot of things to do with this research to be recognized as a great work. Otherwise, her grandfather won't become a god. She couldn't become one either. You must become a god. That was her grandfather's will. I was unable to do so. The line preceded it. It was her grandfather's dying wish. Her grandfather entrusted it to her. All of his research. A god can't be physically brought back to life. A god is made of the hearts of the people. <clears throat> a god is made in the hearts of the people who remain alive. Her grandfather will live on in her heart. His exploits will be known to many, and all the scholars will fight to read his documents, to steal them from each other. And they will learn that he, about Hifumi Takano, who began his research during the war. They will, they will know that nobody understood him and that he ended up devoting his lonely life to his research. And finally, they will extol his grand achievement. All right. That'll do it for tonight. I apologize for being a bit of a negative Nancy, but even in things that I really enjoy, if there's something in it that's really bad, I'm not going to hold back. Uh, and yeah, that whole history lesson was just, that was not good. And I, and I really apologize. Like you can't make that entertaining as a streamer, unfortunately. Um, Hey, maybe the worst is out of the way. Like, we got it out of the way is how I'm going to look at it anyway. But uh, we will be back here again tomorrow evening. Uh, we will be starting at about 6.45 p.m. Eastern Daylight. So, yeah, same same deal. Uh, I'm, I'm putting off Trails of Cold Steel 4 an extra couple hours a night just for you people. So... You better appreciate it.